Alright guys, welcome back. Today let's continue my Harry Potter reviews and talk about Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The first Harry Potter movie that is not a faithful adaptation to the books because after the first three books, all the Harry Potter books got in bigger and bigger, like 600 to 800 pages. So the Goblet of Fire is an interesting movie adaptation, but it's still a fantastic movie, even though it's got some differences. And I wanted to talk about the omissions first before I talk about the actual movie. The omissions from book to film. Now, this one, like 4, 5, and 6, like Goblet of Fire, um, Order of the Phoenix, and Half-Blood Prince, all three of these have a lot of omissions. But to me, these ones... Like, it doesn't make the movie worse, because the movie, I think, is still fantastic. I think there's so many incredible things about Goblet of Fire, the movie. It's just a shame that there were so many things omitted, because they couldn't make it... Like, they couldn't be super faithful after this, and uh, instead, they could have made two parts, but they, of course, didn't. They did that for the last film, but if they made two parts for each one of these, for 4, 5, 6, and 7, it would have been weird. So, with Gobble to Fire, they streamlined a lot of things, where this one, this one, like, like, Order of the Phoenix and Apple Prince, both, they all suffered from, be from losing things in the book, but the movie, this movie in particular, Gobble to Fire, is so fluid and actually feels like you don't even need all those things, like, they don't even, like, all the little omissions in this movie that are taken out don't even matter, honestly, in the movie itself. It's so weird because I love I would have loved to see it more faithful, but this one, you could watch this movie and know nothing about the differences in the book and be totally fine and understand it completely. They don't admit, they admit things, but it does, it makes, they write the script in this movie to make it seem like it doesn't even have, have those things exist, like the omissions in the book. Like, for example, in the book, the beginning of the book, of course, has the Dursleys in it. It doesn't have it in this one, in the movie. Um, Harry wakes up after the nightmare in at the Weasley's house, and Mrs. Weasley doesn't even appear, um, which is so unfortunate. You don't see Julie Walters in this movie. She's This is the only one she doesn't appear in. And then as the movie goes along, as the book goes along, you also... Harry also encounters Dobby the house elf, who is very important in the book, who gives Harry the gillyweed, and Harry is in the reason why Harry can breathe underwater in the second task. Um, and also, all the pensive scenes where, like, um, they talk about the different dement uh, the different Death Eaters that were on trial. It's only uh, squeezed down into one with Igor Karkaroff, and the thing with Rita Skeeter where you realize that she's an unregistered animagus in the book is not present in this movie like Hermione keeps having this bug like this ladybug around her the whole book and like she real she frames um she frames Rita Skeeter at the end of the book because Rita Skeeter is an unregistered animagus and would go to would be in big trouble because of that so things like that it's unfortunate that they're that those things are omitted from the movie, but they it doesn't matter though. It, honestly, even though I would have loved to see all those things, <laughs> because it's just implied, like it's just implied stuff that you don't see. And the thing I love too is that I read online that in this one, they tried their best to even put little things, references throughout the movie that reference those plot points that are not in this in the movie. Like, for example, whenever they're at camp at the beginning of the movie for the Quidditch World Cup, Dobby, like, two house elves are riding on horses in at that camp, and it could be Dobby and Winky, the two characters from the book. So that's just funny that they do those little nods, even though they're not prevalent plot points in the movie. So I just thought that was funny, seeing these different references that are omitted from the movie, uh, from book to movie like it's just funny seeing those omissions so I really did enjoy their their effort to put in those things even if they're not a prevalent thing in the movie so like I said this is the first one that really is neutered uh, with uh, subplots that like don't fully like they could be changed by somebody else like for example Neville is the one who gives Harry the Gillyweed which actually in my opinion makes it great because it makes Neville a better character in 4 and 5 because in 5, too, Neville is the one who kind of does get all the plot, like, conveniences because the other there's other characters that are written out of the movie for 5, too. So it's just funny seeing that Neville is is more f a better-fledged character in 4 and 5, like, in the movies. Like, that's really cool. 
even though he was in the books, like they make him more out to be more important in four and five, like in the movie. So that's really awesome. So there's a lot of omissions like that. So uh, all that aside, let's talk about the actual movie, like what they've got in this movie. So I like that it opened up with the with the nightmare Harry has, where the old Muggle caretaker is in that house, and then that's where Wormtail and Voldemort and this other guy who's going to take out Voldemort's plan, like uh, like they go, they kill, or Lord Lord Voldemort kills the Muggle caretaker, and then Harry wakes up at the at the Weasleys and has a has the nightmare, and then they go to a port key where they meet Amos Diggory and Cedric Diggory, um, who are these two important characters throughout this. And Cedric Diggory, played by Robert Pattinson, which is so funny to see him. I think this is his first film role. Robert Pattinson, the guy most famous for the role that he hates, which is Twilight, is really great in this movie, and he's a great actor anyways. Like, that movie Good Time, he was really good in. Um, so he's a great actor, and I love seeing him in this first movie. Like, that's cool seeing him in his first role. He does a really great job in this movie. Like, he feels like a natural in this role. So, so they all meet Amos Diggory and Cedric Diggory. They go to the Quidditch World Cup. Um, and then they meet Victor Crumb. Like, watch him, like, compete, like, at the World Cup. Where he becomes important later, Victor Crumb, as well. And then they go to they go back to camp, and then there's an attack on the camp by Death Eaters, which are first introduced in this in this book and movie. And they then the guy who is at the beginning of the movie with Voldemort and Wormtail, who's played by David Tennant, awesome. He uh, he does the dark mark up in the air, and Harry sees that, and then Barty Crouch, the guy who will later become the quit it, the person in charge of the Triwizard Cup. He, um, like, he sees this and thinks Harry did it, and then, like, like, of course, Arthur Weasley says, like, how would, uh, three 13-year-old muggles know how to know that curse? Like, nobody would know about that. So, I like the fact that, that this dark mark is let up, and it means that Voldemort is back. Like, they are all, they're all still in denial about it. Not Harry, not Hermione, not Ron, but... Everybody, as you will realize in 4 and 5, like, are in denial. And again, this is another book-to-movie difference where, like, they become more in denial in this, but in the fifth movie, it's different because in the fifth movie, they, they start to be in denial then that he's back. But in this one, they kind of say in the movie, in the book, that, like, like they, they're denying he's not back, like Barty Crouch and Fudge. But, like, in 5, it's where it starts in the movies. But... But they start, they kind of deny that, that they think Voldemort's back. They just think it's something that's, it can't be him. They're just in denial of him coming back. And I like how after this, they go to Hogwarts. And this is the most interesting, one of the most interesting years at Hogwarts because this is the year of the Triwizard Cup. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, I got it right here. The Triwizard Cup. I actually bought this at Universal. But uh, it's the year of the Triwizard Cup. Or... Er, Triwizard Tournament, and they get these two other schools, Bo Bottens and Durmstrang, where the, it's a game of, like, three tasks, where, like, you could win riches uh, and become fully famous, and only three people from each, one person from each school competes, and people do their drawings, and then you realize that Victor Crum from Durmstrang is the, is the winner of Durmstrang, then Flair Delacour from Bo Battens is the winner, and then, or, or is uh, chosen, and then Cedric Diggory from Hogwarts is chosen, but then somebody put Harry Potter's name in there, because Harry Potter's name appears, and Harry Potter becomes a Triwizard Competer. So he, Harry Potter, the one person who's the most famous and doesn't want to be a part of this, is drawn and put into this by somebody. Um... So somebody put his name in the gavel of fire, and everybody's loop freaking out. Like they, like how could he have done that? Like he's, like, and he has to compete. Like it's got a binding magical contract, as Barty Crouch says. So like he has to compete and and actually play, no matter what. Like he can't do anything about it. So it's horrible that they have. Like Harry didn't do this. Has to play this game where people die, 
and he even has his talk with Sirius, the one talking in this movie. The book had more scenes with Sirius, but there's only one scene in this movie where Sirius and him talk at the fire. Um, and Sirius says, like, somebody, there's evil within the walls. There's somebody doing this. This is not by chance. And how Eeyore Kakarov, who is the, the headmaster of Durmstrang or whatever, he is was a Death Eater. So, like, Sirius is giving Harry these hints that, like, there's a reason why you're being part of this tournament because there's evil trying to get you. Like, you are in danger. And I love that one scene with Sirius, and it sucks that I didn't have more of him. Because in the book, there were, like, two or three other scenes where you see him. But, but he's... Uh, Gary Oldman's great in the one scene he's in, but it's just unfortunate we don't see him enough. We see him a lot more in Five, which is great, but in the Five movie. Um, and then I love how we also get introduced to Mad-Eye Moody, Alistair Mad-Eye Moody, this crazy-looking guy who becomes the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher who has the eye that moves around fluidly and, like, can see behind the back of his head, like, with the eye. Um... He lost his eye, apparently, and Mad-Eye Moody, like, he, since I said he's the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher this year, he, he in class, teaches Harry, Ron, Hermione, and everybody else about the three unforgivable curses, which play an important factor in this movie and book, in which he teaches the three curses in a classroom. Um, one is the Imperious Curse, which... Imperio, which is where you can control somebody, like literally control their will. The Cruciatus Curse, Crucio, which is torture curse. And then the final curse, the killing curse, Avada Kedavra. And he says, any one of these will send you an Asgrand prison if you ever say or utter them, which is funny, the Mad-Eye Moody says them. Um, but, but I love the fact that you get introduced to those three, and the... Cruciatus Curse and the Avada Kedavra Curse are very important throughout this movie. Uh, really, like, especially at the end of the movie. But, uh, but I really love that scene. And I love how that makes Neville a great character, too, because Mad-Eye Moody tells, talks to Neville about what's the second curse, and he says the Imperial, or the Cruciatus Curse, and then you realize later that it's because Neville is his parents were tortured into madness by that curse by a Death Eater. So that's horrible. And I I love that little layers of that where it's like you like you don't realize that as this goes on, but and I can't remember whenever it states it in the books, but but Neville like like his parents were tortured by that curse, so like that's horrible that Mad Eye Moody is affecting him that way, telling him what's this curse, and it's the one that his parents were affected by. So it, again, it makes Neville a great character in this movie as well. I love how he keeps building him up as well, even though he's a side character, but he's great. Um, and I like how the first act is, or the first task is going to be commenced, and like Harry gets help from, like he gets help from Hagrid about the dragons, that the dragons are going to be first task, so Harry goes and tells Cedric, just out of being nice, I think, like, he just wants to help Cedric, too, like, just tell him that dragons is the first task. And the, the first task is really great, because it's where Harry has to, like, fight a Hungarian horntail, an actual, like, a full-on dragon, I guess, is it a dragon, or is it a wyvern? But they call it a dragon. Um, but he's a full-on dragon that... Harry's got to get this golden egg, and then Harry uses his wa his magic to bring out his firebolt, and flies around the school with the dragon chasing him to get the egg, and it's actually really action-packed and really great. One of the coolest sequences on a broomstick in the movies, and I really enjoyed that. I think it's actually extended from the book, where the book, I think, just might have been right in that location, but in this one, he goes through Hogwarts, like, outside of the building, or outside of the school. That's really cool, and that's a great first, a first task, and it's very action-packed. Um, and whenever Harry gets the, like, opens the egg, like, it screams and screeches, and he doesn't know what, what he doesn't understand what the clue is, like, it's a clue to what the next task will be. And I forgot to mention that Ron, after the, after Harry is announced a Triwizard, like, like, person that's going to be a part of it, Ron starts to have this horrible, like, jealousy towards him. But after the first task, uh, Ron and him make up, and I think it's really good because they actually have, like, like, I liked how they get pissed at each other, and they actually have, like, 
their friendship is dwindling in a way because Ron thinks that he did it on purpose and he's just jealous of him. But then, then after the first task, he realizes that that's not true and Ron was just kind of out of his mind, like, that Harry would do that, but he didn't. So, I really enjoyed, like, their them not liking each other for a while in the movie, in the book, because it it makes these characters grow and develop more. So I really enjoyed that as well. Um, and then I like how it get it goes to the Yule Ball, which is the like the dance, the annual dance that they have for the Twi Triwizard Tournament, where like all three schools dance um, at whatever school they're at. And they're at Hogwarts, so they're having the big dance. And it's really cool because it it makes these characters feel like they've grown since the first movie. They're 14 years old, but, like, I love how they're going to dances. I love how they're trying to find dates. I think it's fun. And I think that it just shows how great of characters these are and makes them more interesting as as this one goes along. Um, and I love whenever you see that shot of Hermione, kind of like a Cinderella type of shot where, like, she's walking down the stairs and she's beautiful. Um... And it really shows how different of, like... Like, she already was beautiful anyways, Emma Watson. But, like, it, I like how that moment... It just... I don't know. Like, it was just such a sweet moment to see her walking down the stairs and everybody's in awe of her. Like, I just think that's great. Um, so I just... I really love that scene a lot. And I love how after the dance ends, Ron has been messing with her, like because she got a date, and then they didn't, and th then they got Pravati and, uh, God, I forgot what the other girl's name is, the two twins, um, Pravati and Padma Patil, um, Harry and Ron got them as dates, but then they didn't dance with them, so they left, and then Ron gets more mad at Hermione, because Hermione got Victor Crumb as a date, and I love that scene where, like, they just get pissed at each other, and again, Hermione gets mad at them, too, to where all these characters are challenged, and they're not just, like, perfect friends, like, they've got obstacles to face, they've got obstacles to go through, like, in terms of, like, their friendship, and I love that scene where Hermione's telling Ron, like, why didn't you just pluck up the courage to ask me, um, and not as a last resort, and then, uh, then I love whenever they walk away and Hermione just screams, Ron, you spoiled everything, and then starts crying, and, like, it just, it gave these characters, like, stakes in their friendship, like, I just thought that they really were challenged with their friendship in this movie, and they will in other movies, but in this one, it just did a really good job of that. Um, so after the Yule Ball, it's like Cedric gives Harry the hint about the egg, which I thought was a cool difference, like where Harry gave Cedric the clue about the dragon, so Cedric gave Harry the clue about the egg, and Harry goes into a bath and has it underwater while Mer Moaning Myrtle is there again. That's a cool appearance of her, seeing her again. But Harry hears the egg underwater, and it's a normal angelic mermaid voice singing, like, about something that they took, and you need to find it. So, then Harry needs to figure out how to go underwater and, for an hour and and be able to breathe. So, Neville in this film gives him gillyweed instead of Dobby. And, again, it just builds on Neville's character. I thought that was a good choice, even though I would have loved to see Dobby in this movie. But, but it's still a good choice, though, that Neville is more developed. And then we get to the second task, where Harry does go underwater with Gillyweed. He's able to breathe underwater. He grows gills. He grows fins. Um, and he goes, and it's cool seeing, un like, another task, but it's underwater. And instead of being, like, a drag fighting a dragon in the air, it's like you're underwater with all these mermaids and grindylows and these creepy little things that, like, are scary looking. And it's cool with like how all three of the all four of the uh competitors do do their things underwater like Cedric and Flora will have like this bubble around their mouth that like keeps them have air and then Victor Crumb has has like a literal shark head whenever he comes in and I thought that was really cool and then Harry realizes what that song meant like what they took and he needs to get them back is people like their treasures um in which Fleur Delacour's sister is Fleur's treasure, and then Victor Crumb, um, his treasure is Hermione, and then Harry's treasure is Ron, and then Cedric's treasure is Cho Chang, because Cho Chang, Harry likes too, but she also, he also tried to ask her out, but then Cedric took her on a date for the Yule Ball. So, so it's funny that all the, like, the three people besides Fleur's sister are very important to Harry, like, Cho, Hermione, and Ron. Like, that's funny, that they all are very important in, in his story 
And then Fleur is, for some reason, um, taken out. Um, after she's she's forced to retire, and I don't understand what that what that meant. And like her sister was just gonna be left in there to die. Um, I didn't get that. So then, Victor and Cedric take their prizes. Um, but Harry takes Ron, but then he realizes that Fleur's sister's still down there, so he saves her too. And I love how that makes it to where when Harry pull, pushes them up and he goes down and his gills are going out and he's turning normal again where he can't breathe underwater, he does that spell, Ascentio, I think, and he flies out of the water and he gets second place after Cedric because he saved two people. He actually saved Fleur's sister too. Which was just a selfless thing that I think was great for his character. I love that he saved her as well. Um, and then we get this moment after the second act where I really like where Mr. Crouch talks to Harry about like, oh, I've, I've known about you forever, ever since you were born, and like the story is his the story is insane and and uh, about losing one's family, and he says, well, life goes on, and here we are, and then like Harry. Ron, Hermione, and Haggard are together in the woods, and then Harry finds Barty Crouch dead, and his scar stings. Um, but then after he dies, he goes to Dumbledore's office and looks into this pensive, which means it's a thing where you can view memories where Harry falls in, and he, and he sees the memories of Igor Karkaroff being interrogated and uh, being a Death Eater, and then Barty Crouch Jr. is there, who David Tennant plays, um, Marty Crouch's son, who is an actual, like, the actual Death Eater, like, another Death Eater, and he gets, um, he gets taken before Barty Crouch says to him, like, you're no son of mine, and then Barty Crouch just screams, Barty Crouch Jr. just screams at him, like, ah, ah, and it shows, it's David Tennant's performance, it's great, but, but you see that great memory of, like, that, so then it plays perfect in the next scene, Whenever Harry goes outside, like, walks outside Dumbledore's office and hears Igor Karkaroff and Snake talking, and Igor Karkaroff says, it must be a sign service, you must know, and then the door opens and then he's got his wrist and it's got the dark mark on it, Karkaroff. So it plays really well, showing that scene, that, that scene of memories of Karkaroff being interrogated, and then showing him in the moment right now, talking to Snape with the dark mark. And they even said in the pensive that Snape is still Dumbledore's... I mean, still a Voldemort supporter, and Karkaroff says, that's, like, he, Karkaroff says it's true, and then Dumbledore says, no, he's part of mine now, so it plays into Snape, you don't know what it, where his loyalties lie right now, so that's really cool, um, and I really love that, I love that moment, it's just really cool seeing, like, building up this tension and building up these characters and building up if they're if they're good or not, like Snape or Karkaroff, like you don't know, and it really does a good job of that. Um, and then Snape, after Karkaroff leaves, Harry thinks that Snape, or I mean Snape thinks that Harry is taking Polyjuice Potion, um, because he's losing parts of his potion ingredients, and Harry just thinks that's outrageous, and I wonder if Snape knew about the Polyjuice Potion from the second movie. I think he did, and I think maybe in the book it explained it, but it didn't explain it in the movie. So maybe that's what Snape's saying. Like, he thinks that he's do they're brewing Polyjuice Potion again. So I think that's great, and it plays until the ending with the Polyjuice Potion. But, anyways, we get to the final task, which is a maze, which is a very cool location for a final task where in this maze, hair, it's dark, it's scary. Uh, Victor Crumb is bewitched by somebody, I'm assuming Karkaroff, um, or maybe even Wormtail, maybe even Voldemort, but he's bewitched, and Harry and Cedric, like, Fleur gets gets uh, attacked by Crumb, by Crumb, bewitched, and then Cedric and Harry fight off Crumb, and then they both grab the, the cup, the, the champion's Triwizard Cup, this thing, and then they touch it, and then it becomes a port key, and it teleports them to a graveyard where Harry immediately realizes where he's at. It says it says Riddle on the gravestone, and Cedric is immediately murdered, and it's so actually really incredibly sad that he he gets murdered by a Wormtail, uh, the Avada Kedavra spell, which again plays important talking about the three unforgivable curses early in the movie. And 
like I said, Cedric has immediately killed her, and it's sad. And, like, Voldemort comes back to life. Um, he is reborn by Wormtail, and then his supporters come back, including Lucius Malfoy and the Crab and Goyle's dads. And I love how he, Voldemort is reborn, and he's creepy. He looks very vicious and creepy in, in all the movies after this. And Ray Fiennes is just incredible in this role. Like, he blows me away. He's such a great character in this in these movies. I love him so much. And this is the first one he's actually in. Because in Sorcerer's Stone, I think it was a different actor. It looked like, at least. But, uh... But I love the fact that now Voldemort being alive, fully alive and well, now can touch Harry in terms of, like, his mother's love kept him safe whenever he tried to kill him when he was a baby. But now he can, he's free. Like, he can actually go and... Voldemort can actually torture him and kill him, and he uses the Cruciatus Curse on Harry, tortures him. Um, and then I love that moment where Harry runs behind a gravestone, and then Voldemort just screams, "Don't run away from me, Harry Potter! I I want to see the, I want to see your look on your face when I kill you. I want to see the life leave your eyes." And then Harry just that Daniel Radcliffe is so great in that one per, one shot, but man, it's so good where. After Voldemort says that, Harry's behind the gravestone, gravestone and he just goes, like, he just gets pissed, like, he gets so angry. And he goes out, and then they have the they have the amazing epic duel, which will keep going throughout the franchise, but he has that epic duel where Harry says Expelliarmus, Voldemort says Avada Kedavra. Both of their wands connect, but then we've got this great emotional moment where whenever they both connect out of... Voldemort's wand, four spirits appear, and it's the spirit of the Muggle caretaker, it's the spirit of Cedric Diggory, and it's the spirit of Harry's parents, uh, Lily and James. And Cedric says to Harry, like, Harry, I want you to take my body back. I want you to take my body back with you. And um, and then we then Harry's father says, Harry, we can only help you for uh, really quick. Like, you can only take a couple seconds, but we can break the we can break the stand. Do you understand? Like, uh, we can break the chain. And then I love how his mom just says to him, like, go on, sweetheart, sweetheart, you're ready. Let go, let go. And then Harry lets go of the, of this, of his wand and his spell. And then he grabs the port key and disappears back into Hogwarts. And Voldemort screams, no! And then, like, so Harry has evaded Voldemort again. But that was such an epic showdown between them both, even though it's so brief, it's so epic. Um, and so heartbreaking and emotional seeing Cedric saying, take my body back, and then having Harry's parents talk to him and say, like, we can help you just briefly, really quickly to get you out of here. It was just really good. Um, and then that moment where Harry comes back and lands back at where everybody is in Hogwarts, Harry screams, like, because Dumbledore tries to grab him and then Harry's like holding on to Cedric's body like no 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 and then he's like he's and then Harry says to Dumbledore like he's back Voldemort's back um I couldn't leave Cedric's body there I couldn't leave him there not there and then like Dumbledore's like I understand Harry and then then uh that moment where Amos Tiggery Cedric's dad like sees Cedric's dead body his son's dead body I actually get choked up. Like, it's actually that emotional. Because you just hear him go, let me through, let me through! That's my son! That's my boy! And then, like, he just screams, my boy! And just, it's so heartbreaking, and it's so sad, and so incredibly hard to watch. That actor, I don't know his name, that plays Amos Diggory, is so incredibly good in that moment. Like, that is heartbreaking, and it makes me choke up, and I... It's just so hard to watch. So Harry, Mad Eye Moody takes Harry up back to Hogwarts, like while Amos just cries over his dead son's body, and then you realize the truth, because there's even more to this story where Mad Eye Moody has been stealing Polyjuice Potion from Snape, and he's Barty Crouch Jr., the one at the beginning of the movie in the dream, in Harry's dream, that when the Muggle caretaker was killed, that. 
Barty Crouch Jr. orchestrated everything in this movie. Kind of like how Lucius did in Chamber of Secrets. Lucius Malfoy, where like he had gave the book to Ginny and that all escalated. In this one, Barty Crouch Jr. escalated everything. He made it to where he told Cedric about the egg. He told Haggard to help tell Harry about the dragons. He, he hexed Crumb, I think. So that made everything work in Barty Crouch Jr.'s favor to where he sent Harry to Lord Voldemort directly. And that's what Voldemort's task of him was at the beginning of the movie, and he succeeded. He made it to Voldemort. Or he made Harry get to Voldemort. And then we get that moment where, like, he, after he changes back, like, Snape and McGonagall and Dumbledore are there and subdue Crouch Jr. But... I, I love that moment where you realize it's him, and it's just David Tennant, and it's just, David Tennant is so great in this performance, like, he's so good, and he's barely in the movie, but he's so great, um, but, and I love the fact that whenever, even whenever he's subdued, like, Crouch just says, Crouch Jr. just says, you know what this means, don't you, that he's back, he's fully back, um, and then, like, they, they're gonna send him back to Azkaban Prison, like, he's, Party Crouch Jr. is going back, but but he made he succeeded in his plan, like he did it. Even though Harry escaped, he sent Harry to Voldemort. So great, and the real Mad Eye Moody is in this chest that Harry saw earlier in the movie that was shaking around, and Mad Eye Moody's just in this big chest inside, like just trapped in there, and is and he's just sitting in there. He's been in there the whole school year, apparently, the real one. And then we get this, again, emotional, great scene where Dumbledore speaks on behalf of Cedric at Hogwarts and says, like, um, the Ministry wouldn't want me to tell you this, um, but doing, but if I didn't tell you this, like, it would be an insult to his memory um, that Cedric was, Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. Um, and I just love that moment, like I said, where he says the Ministry doesn't want me to tell you this, but doing not doing so, I think, would be an insult to his memory. Like, they'd be hiding the fact that he died by Voldemort. Um, and I love the fact that Dumbledore has that inspirational yet sad speech where he says, like, even though we come from different places, even though we speak in different tongues, our heart speed is one. And as this year taught us, our friendships are even more stronger than ever. Um, and let us remember, let us celebrate a boy who was kind and true up to the very end. And it's just so chilling and so emotional, that line that Michael Gambon is just incredible in that moment. But it's just so sad, so heartbreaking. Um, and I love that moment where Harry's packing up for leaving. And then Dumbledore goes and talks to him and consoles him and says that, like, difficult times lie ahead. Um, and eventually we're going to have to do, uh, have the choice between what is, what is easy and what is, um, what is difficult and what is easy. And that he's not alone. He's got friends here. So he, he will have help. So it just, it really, it was a great scene between him and Dumbledore, the last scene. Um, and then we have that great last scene of bittersweet goodbyes where like, since, all the other people from the different schools aren't from Hogwarts. This is the, the only year they're there. They they leave. Um, Victor Crumb says goodbye to Hermione. Fleur says goodbye. Fleur and her daughter say goodbye to Ron. Um, Harry, Ron, and Hermione have a great moment where, like, Hermione just says, like, everything's going to change now, isn't it? Like, like they're, they're growing up, but they've encountered so many things so far, like, horrific things and great things. And I love that that kind of perfectly established what this movie was about and the book was about is that everything changes in this one. Everything did change. Uh, Voldemort's back, they're growing up, they're encountering everything new and everything different. So I just thought that was a great way to end it. And I love showing um, the Durham staring ship, like, leaving and the Beau Batten's, like, carriage leaving. So everybody's leaving. Um, and it's a bittersweet goodbye and it's a great bittersweet way to end the movie. And I... I don't know, I, everything about this movie just blew me away again, just rewatching it. And I haven't seen it in a couple of years, like the other Harry Potter movies, but man, this one might be one of my absolute favorites, even though I love them all. I don't know if I, like, like, I'd say, out of the four I've watched so far, I think this is my favorite now, because I, even though I love Sorcerer's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, and Prisoner of Azkaban, I love a lot, 
this one might be my favorite so far based on emotion, emotion and an action and everything these characters have done and established in this movie I felt like was so incredibly important and this is the halfway chapter the halfway point of the film of the books and films where these characters are growing up becoming different they've got to the point where they are encountering danger they are growing up so I I love this chapter and I think it's so incredible um, this one just blew me away again watching it so I really love this movie so thanks for anybody who stayed long enough to listen to me talk about this because I just it's so important to me such an important franchise tell me what you think down below of what you think of this movie um, or what you think of the other one so I really love this one on a rewatch so thank you guys so much for watching um, just like comment subscribe if you feel like it so thank you guys so much for watching my video